Welcome everybody to the study school. It's good to see everyone. And uh, we'll be, we've been studying temperance or self-control. I'm sorry, we've been studying Christian character. And today we're going to study, study temperance or self-control. If I can make my mouth work here this morning. Uh, this is not an often discussed subject, temperance. When's the last time you said, I uh, heard a message on temperance? The first thing you think of is something else, which we'll discuss in a minute. That's why I added self-control. Um, welcome everybody that's here. I pray the Lord's uh, blessing your family. And uh, thank you for to see everyone. Let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to be with us as we uh, begin our class. Father, we thank you for the fruits of the Spirit. We thank you for the character that the Lord Jesus Christ has shown us and displayed when he was here on earth and later on. We thank you, Father, for the example that Christ is to us. We pray that we would be imitators of Christ, that we would follow him and imitate his character and be like him, and uh, that we might be approved to servants, that we might be uh, servants that are ready to serve and would display the character of Christ that people might see that we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and we have a relationship with him and that he died for our sins and rose again the third day. Thank you for each one that's represented here. We thank you for those that are watching via the streaming, that you would bless each family. We pray for all those who are ill, that you would raise them up again through your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, I approached the subject today, temperance, with a little bit of trepidation because many things, some things, well, many things are easy to explain or teach or portray. Some things are hard. And this is meekness I thought was very difficult on the scale of, of difficulty to portray a truth so that we might understand what the Lord wants us to understand about it. Um, so as I begin thinking about, by way of introduction, as I begin thinking about temperance and looking at the, what the Word of God said, I realized that the one, this is not in your handout, but one of the great battlefields in Christianity is, you know, we think America is a great battlefield in Christianity because there are people that are so anti-God and anti-Christ. And we think about Russia or China where communism prevails. And we think about North Korea, which is a great, there is no battle there. Satan has won. And there are many other places. But I think the great battlefield for Christianity is in our mind. Uh, Paul said in Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And then it goes on to say, Paul talks about renewing your mind to prove the will of God. The, the battle, much of the battle of Christianity is in our mind. And um, Jerry Bridges, who wrote The Practice of Godliness, said, and this is, a, I, this is a very distinctive quote. I've not heard this before. I think this is really a good good way to portray what is going on out there. Our minds are mental greenhouses. What a term. Mental greenhouses where unlawful thoughts, once planted, sometimes are nurtured and watered before being transported into the real world of unlawful actions. These actions are savored in the mind long before they were enjoyed or practiced in reality. The thought life then is our first line of defense in the battle of self-control, which is what we're going to be talking about, temperance or self-control. The mind is the battlefield. It's a mental greenhouse where we either cultivate a thought or we can stop it right then and there before it becomes an action. Now, on a humorous note, um, a man named Alistair Begg uh, said this, uh, 
he was talking about a, a pastor named Alan Redpath used to talk to young people about the vital importance of what he called, this is another strange quote, blanket victory. He was referring not to some strategy for overall success, blanket strategy, blanket victory, but he was talking about the necessity of getting out of bed at a reasonable time in the morning to conduct the business of the day. If a young person couldn't get the victory over his blankets, it was very unlikely that he'd be self-controlled in any area. And actually, there's a famous speech in the military about making up your bed. You know, it starts right away. And it starts with our first thoughts. And so we, we mentioned the mental greenhouse of the mind where thoughts become fertilized and we start thinking about them and decide whether we're going to do them. And then just what we're going to do is first thing, getting out of bed and making a decision to move forward and, and have mastery over that. Our scripture, which is in your handout, there is Galatians 5, 22 and 23 again. Temperance is a fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, <laughs> gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So there are nine fruits of the Spirit. Against such, there is no law. Now that word, well, let me read um, to you a quote by um, a gentleman named Whitney. He said, Our bodies are naturally inclined, unfortunately, we live in a world of sin. Our bodies are naturally inclined to ease, to pleasure to gluttony, to sloth or laziness. Unless we practice self-control, our bodies will tend to serve evil more than God. We must carefully discipline our bodies and how we walk, that's how we live in this world, or else we will become and conform more to its ways rather than the ways of Christ. If you do nothing, you'll go the way of the world, the flesh, and the devil. If you take your life in hand and exercise discipline and self-control, you can follow the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ, is what he's saying. That's from Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald S. Whitney. Now, the word temperance is a noun. This is in your handout under 1A. And the word is pronounced encratia, encratia excuse me, and it literally means inward strength or power, and it means temperance, self-control, mastery, control, and it's translated temperance in the King James. Now, that's a good translation. It's our word that's been corrupted over the years. Temperance today is commonly used to refer to um, and primarily, in many cases, to abuse of alcohol. And I mentioned to somebody uh, during the week I was going to be talking about, I talked about meekness last week, or talked about temperance this week, and the person said, I don't drink. <laughs> and, I, and I laughed and I said, well, it means other things too. And that's the issue with using temperance because people's minds automatically go to alcohol, and if they're not involved in alcohol, then they just ignore it. It's not just alcohol. Temperance uh, spiritually, temperance and self-control, this is your handout, involves the power of the Holy Spirit to restrain the flesh from all sins. So not just alcohol, not just immorality. Um, originally, this word came, came um, from a usage in the Greek uh, that referred to immorality only. The Greeks, when they employed it, it was primarily towards immorality. The New Testament uses it to refer to all sins of the flesh. Um, Jerry Bridges has said uh, in the practice of godliness, self-discipline is the exercise of inner strength 
under the direction of sound judgment that enables us to do, to think, and to say the things that are pleasing to God. Um, the root word, note here, and this is, I'd like everybody to turn to Ephesians 1, 18 through 20 and follow along here as I read. You'll follow along silently. The root word, Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. The root word is K-R-A-T-O-S. It means, it's pronounced kratos, and it means power or strength. And that's the root word of temperance or self-control used up here, the noun. And it's used in Ephesians 1, 18, verses through 20. And let's read that, if you'll follow along as I read. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of, his, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding, verse 19, our key verse here, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? That word is dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S. It's a noun, it means like, that's the, it means power, might, strength, ability. It's where we get our word dynamite from. Think about how powerful dynamite is. And it's greatness, like what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward, to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That second word power is K-R-A-T-O-S, kratos, meaning strength, power, might, and also can mean a mighty deed or an act of power. In verse 20, which he wrought, God, wrought in Christ when he, one, raised him from the dead, that's the resurrection, and set him, or Christ, at his own right hand in heavenly places. We call that as the ascension because he ascended into heaven. So here's the point. I got so excited when I read this the first time. Um, pastor had called to ask me a question and, and about the song service or something, and I said, let me share this with you. Listen to this. Did you know that the same divine power and strength that God used to raise Christ up from the dead, his resurrection, and to seat him in the heavenly places the right hand of God is the same power that he gives us to help us have self-control and live the Christian life and have temperance in our life. And, and, um, so that's the B. Paul shows us in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the indwelling Holy Spirit enables, produces, and helps us to cultivate the same power for our self-control that actually God's control in our lives. It's the same power that he used to raise Christ from the dead, the resurrection, and also the same power that he uh, raised, helped him to send to heaven. And that's, that to me is exciting. It took a lot of power to raise the Lord from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes a lot of power to, to enable us to have self-control over the sin in the world as well. I, I just love that. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, and 27, there's a different use. The verb is used here in this passage, and I'll read that. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. In other words, they all run. But one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man, verse 25 of chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. There's our word. There's our word, but this is a verb, and it's pronounced in crot you ame. And that's, I spell that out for you in the handout. It means to exercise self-control. That's the verb form of the noun. To exercise self-control or temperance. And this passage, it refers figuratively and symbolically to rigid self-control practiced by the athletes to win the prize, the race, or the crown. And if I finish verse 25, and every man that strives for the mastery, that is to, to win, is temperate in all things, self-controlled in all things. Now they that do it, that's the athletes, obtain a corruptible crown. They had two different types of games. They had the Olympics and another set of games. 
and they would get a wreath that would go on their head. And Paul said, that's something that will fade away and disintegrate. But we will receive an incorruptible crown, he's saying in verse 25. So he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so I fight. And that's actually an allusion, allusion to boxing. You no know, boxing is in the Bible. Not as one that beateth the air, just punching at the air, but I but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul is saying that figuratively and symbolically, the rigid self-control practiced by athletes to win the prize and race and crown should be the same effort that we use to have self-control and live our lives. Notice the verse, self-discipline, verse 27. He exercises that to prevent his disqualification or disapproval and favor, favor, a failure, excuse me. Um, I have an anonymous quote from an article that I really liked because it put it in pretty simple terms. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul used this verb uh, that we for self control to describe the attitude that believers need to win the prize, comparing them to Olympic athletes, explaining that everyone who competes in the games has to exercise self-control or he won't be a good athlete. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, the athletes, but we do it to receive an imperishable crown. So therefore, um, this is the author's paraphrase of scripture. I run in such a way as not without aim or reason. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I've preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Um, but be careful. There's a warning here. Remember that Paul's running and his boxing and his buffeting were not a reflection of his own self-effort, but they were grace, they were grace, they were grace, three times, grace-based, spirit-empowered effort. For as he said elsewhere, and again, this is the author's paraphrase, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain or fruitless, but I labored, and this was Paul's responsibility, he labored and worked at it, and that's what every believer's responsibility is, but even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God, and that's God's responsibility. God gives us the grace, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to be able to be self-controlled like the athletes that we see. He sovereignly bestowed unmerited favor with me and on me. Uh, Paul argues that athletes exercise self-control because they're motivated by a clearly defined goal and understand that in order to, to achieve that goal, they must, at least for a time, resist all the distractions of the world. You see people going to the big time games, the Super Bowl, the, the uh all the World Series and other significant, and they get all nervous, they get all distracted by all the things that are going on. But we, as running our race, Christianity, we're not to get distracted by the superfluous things out there. We're ordered, we are to exercise self-control because we are motivated by a clearly defined goal. And we understand that to achieve that goal, we must for at least a time resist the distractions that originate from all the things, the flesh, the world, and the devil, the flesh and its desires. In a similar way, believers are charged to control their fleshly pursuits. <clears throat> and uh, and we're not talking, we say the flesh, we're not talking about the body, we're talking about the old nature, the old man, the unredeemed part of our body, um, of our nature, rather, that still lives in our moral bodies with its corrupt, deceptive passions and desires rather than allowing us to be controlled by the new man, the new nature. However, what is referred to as self-control is actually and only 
the result of letting the Holy Spirit take control. The Spirit enabled self-control. That's a descriptive term. It doesn't mean that we, we have the power to control ourselves. Um, it's we have to walk in the Spirit of the Lord and keep in step with the Spirit of the Lord so that we can be self-controlled or disciplined or temperate. Okay. So that brings us to the definition. Now, this is where it was difficult. Looking at the definition, this, the secular definition, this is right out of dictionary.com. Temperance is habitual moderation. You know, practice moderation. Moderation is doing some but not all, being restrained. Or self-restraint in action or words, self-control, including moderation in the indulgence of a natural appetite or passion, especially in the use of alcoholic liquors. So everyone, because of prohibition and all the things that happened in the early 20th century, you say the word temperance, people think about alcohol. So that's why we were using self-control. Um, self-control, I said, well, let's look at self-control. Here's a secular definition of that. Control or restraint of oneself or one's actions or one's feelings. You can see that's a lot better definition. The word moderation makes you think that, well, I can be temperate if I just do a little sin. But that's not true. There's, there's no sinning in self-control. It's complete avoidance of sin. But habitual moderation, that word makes you think, well, I could have a little sin here and there, a white sin, you know, or a, a, a blue sin or something. Um, so let's look at the spiritual definition, okay? Spiritual definition that I came up with is self-control is a, and it's right in your handout, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's an official fruit of the Spirit. It's the ninth fruit of the Spirit that enables us with God's divine power and strength of God for self-control, self-restraint, and self-discipline in all our thoughts, attitudes, words, and actions to restrain us, to hold us back, to bring us into and keep us in faithful harmony with God's will for his glory. Now, if the last part I added, to, to be in God's will, because that means we need to obey him and follow him. If I was just having self-control to follow my own will, that's not real self-control spiritually. That's not real temperance. That's not biblical self-control. That's, that's Scotty's control. Self-control is God's control. And look at the note here. To gain control of your life, give God control. God's control equals our self-control. Now, I'm going to share a quote with you that I really like that kind of resonated with me about um, countermeasure. Now, for those of you that didn't grow up steeped in the spy craft of the, the, uh, the Cold War, a countermeasure is an alternative measure taken to avoid a particular action by the enemy. For example, during World War II, the Japanese uh, would depth charge the submarines that were so effective and sunk 55% of all of the ships that the Japanese had. And it was, so the Japanese went after the US submarines with a vengeance and they would drop depth charge after depth charge after depth charge. Well, at the beginning of the war, they didn't realize they were dropping them too shallow. So all the submarine captains spread the word through the means that they had is to make sure you go deep initially and you'll completely avoid the risk of, of death and having your submarine sunk and people dying. So that as soon as the depth charges would fall, they would go deep. And as a result, because of that countermeasure to that strategy of the Japanese of dropping depth charges, many of the people were saved from uh, being their ships being uh, sunk in death 
and the fall of our captivity. So Edward Welch uses this word countermeasure, and he said, self-control is not the same as self-dependence. Uh, self-dependence, he says, is the way in which we rely on pers our personal willpower to control ourselves. Instead, self-control or temperance is a gift of the Holy Spirit given through faith in Jesus Christ. And here's, here's the quote I want to leave you with. Self-control is a strategic, godly countermeasure to the insatiable, unsatisfiable, that's what that means, the unsatisfiable cravings of sin. Now, just so you know, in case you've never experienced this, if I have a piece of chocolate cake, the only thing that means is that you are just want more chocolate cake. People are not. Yes, that's true. Uh, we used to laugh at, at our son, Ross, because Ross would eat, eat his meal, and he'd say, okay, I'm full, and then, then offer dessert. Oh, I got room for dessert. And we'd say, how could you be? You said you were full. He says, my dessert place is always open. <laughs> so, so the God self-control is, is a strategic, godly countermeasure. It means it works. It saves us. Not saves us from sin, but saves us from failure in the Christian life. And it's a countermeasure to the unsatisfiable cravings of sin. It's the only way we can have success in controlling our, ourselves. We can't control ourselves. God, God helps us to control ourselves. So let's look at the top of page two. We're going to look at principles now. These are, these are designed to point out the facts and principles that we have uh, here in this passage. Now, as an illustration of um, self-control, in Proverbs 25, 28, in the Old Testament gives, I'm reading a quote, the Old Testament gives us a dramatic picture of self-control, and Solomon writes this, uh, like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man, he's a comparison to it. Like a city that's broken into without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. Proverbs 25, 28. He's saying a city that doesn't have any walls is subject to being invaded and, 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 uh, and uh, thieves and robbers coming in and bothering them and taking what they have. That's the same thing. If we have no control over our spirit, the world, the flesh, and the devil makes us susceptible to sin. So, the city-state of those days were walled for protection from marauders, thieves, criminals, uh, uh, foreign armies. No wall meant no protection. And by the same token, no self-control, by analogy, means one is wide open to attack. Remember, Nehemiah went back to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that the city could have protection. The city is wide open to attack from the world of flesh and the devil. We are when we have don't have the wall by analogy of control over our spirit and control over our, uh, our actions. Um, self-control. Such a person that has no self-control is an easy victim when attacked by strong impulses and strong desires. And that causes us to ask the question of ourselves. And we should ask this question, are there any breaks in our walls guarding our hearts? And let's look at the first principle here, C1. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ exercised self-control. He was tempted in all ways like us and was yet without sin. He lived a life of perfect restraint. He was self-controlled perfectly. And if you, I made a, uh, an error there. If you change that Hebrews 14, cause that to be Hebrew, change it to Hebrews 4, 15, uh, which reads, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we, as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in the time of need. We are to be like Christ, who was uh, lived a life of perfect restraint. And that's the gist of number two principle. We are to be like Christ and exemplify self-control in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 tells us, For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And if that the Lord Jesus Christ died for all, then they which live should not live unto themselves, but unto him, Christ, which died for them and rose again. We should live unto Christ and not unto ourselves. Um, and I'm going to let you read the rest of those uh, for time's sake. Um, and Gene Getz has said that a temperate man doesn't lose, or woman, doesn't lose his physical, psychological, and spiritual orientation. He's stable. He's steadfast. He's thinking clear. He doesn't go to extremes. He doesn't go on emotional tangents. He has a sense of inner peace and security. No matter what is happening in life, generally, he's stable. This doesn't mean he ever never has periods of anxiety, but overall he has a sense of stability. In the words of James, he's not a double-minded man. That's Gene Mitz from The Measure of a Man, a quote. And that leads us to number three, a measure of maturity as a believer is our self-control and temperance. In fact, elders are selected and using this essential qualification and mark of maturity in Colossians 3, 2. Uh, that, that's actually uh, First Timothy, thanks, 3, 2. Don't worry about Colossians. I, I must have been thinking about Colossians. That's my favorite book. First Timothy 3, 2 are the qualifications for elders. A bishop then or an elder must be blameless, a, hum, hum, a husband of one wife, vigilant. Vigilant means, it's from a Greek word meaning sober, temperate, <coughs> self-controlled. And the word sober, the next word, means prudent, wise, sensible, sober-minded, self-controlled. It's like a, almost a double whammy there. It says one wife, vigilant sober of good behavior given to hospitality apt to teach and not given to wine no striker no greedy and filthy lucre but patient not a brawler not covetous and goes on for more qualifications but measure of the man uh, maturity is a measure of our I'm sorry a measure of our maturity is a believer's self-control and temperance The Christian, as it pertains to temperance, we're talking about someone that's sober in thought, even keel, moderate. Some people tend to be emotional and impulsive, but the mature saint should have learned stability, consistency, balance. Those who lack temperance are seen bouncing in and out of ministry, constantly changing jobs. Life is a continual roller coaster of extremes, overreactions, unstable relationships, inconsistencies, and faithless living. On the contrary, there's a steadiness to the temperate person. That person prays and waits on the Lord to prevent him from making a foolish or rash decision. He doesn't overreact to problems. He's self-controlled. He thinks before he speaks. I have to work on that. He avoids false excitement but also refuses to be paralyzed, paralyzed by sorrow. He wisely controls his money. He wisely controls his feelings and his words. He's not tossed here and there by every comment he hears off the lips of another. He knows how to ride out the storms of life with God's help. Number three, Paul uses the example of athletes that we read in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, and he uses the military in 1 Timothy 2, 2 through 4, as illustrations of faithful servants who endure hardship to run the race and that are pleasing to God. Paul emphasizes self-control as essential to the Christian life. Number five, self-control is a frequently overlooked and poorly understood fruit of the Spirit. Now, when's the last time you said, oh, hey, let's get together and study temperance or self-control? No, it's not the, 
not a popular topic. Sometimes it's self-convicting. <laughs> and it, 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 in, in the hand that I've written, why it is the last of the nine <clears throat> fruits of the Spirit. It's still an important fruit of the Spirit. It's enabled by the Holy Spirit as we walk in the Spirit. True self-control comes only from God. Our, God does his part. He gives it to us. He gives us his power. We have it available. Our part is to cultivate it. Um, I want to share with you a word. In short or summary, um, self-control describes the personal rule or mastery over fleshly impulses that would be impossible by, for us to do without the Holy Spirit's control. And notice that it's easy to fall into the trap of emphasizing self-control, but it's really self-control that the Lord enables. And the word en on our noun in, in, in kratria does mean in, and it speaks of believers being controlled by the inward strength, inward power, Kratos means power, and means in. This inward strength ultimately, however, is the power of the Holy Spirit, not our own inner power. We have to emphasize that. It's God's power in us. We absolutely cannot control the flesh in our own power. Try as hard as you want. Not now, not ever. Don't fall into this trap. The only one that controls fallen anti-God energy in the flesh is the Holy Spirit. Our part is to walk by and in the Spirit, acknowledging we don't have the power, crying out to Him in the time of urgent need when our fleshly impulses feel like they will overwhelm us, which they will without the Spirit's help, trusting in God's provision for the power to walk for what God commands. He always enables, submitting or yielding to the Spirit's leading, guiding and empowering in the end, experience the victory of the Spirit and able self-control. Um, number six, self-control is included in the list of Christian character and attributes in the Bible. Uh, 2 Peter uh, 1, 5 through 7. If you want to turn there, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, that would be good. This is a one of those progressive passages. And besides this, in verse 5, 2 Peter 1, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness and the brotherly kindness charity or love that's that's a great progression now there's a tremendous amount of material here and what i wanted to do is share uh, john MacArthur's uh, brief uh, summary of this passage now it starts out with saying and besides this which really means for this very reason, because of all of the God-given blessings that are in verses 3 and 4, the believer cannot be indifferent or self-satisfied. For this very reason, give all diligence. There's such an abundance of divine grace given to us, it calls for total dedication. The word diligence means make every effort, make a maximum effort, the Christian life is not lived to the honor of God without effort. Even though God has poured his divine power into the believer, MacArthur says, the Christian himself is required to make a disciplined effort alongside of what God has already done. He's given us the power. And the passage here where he says, add to your faith. The word add is, means uh, uh, to give lavishly and generously in the original language. And in the Greek culture, the word was used for a choir master who was responsible to supply everything that was needed for his choir. And the word never meant to equip sparingly, but
but to supply everything that was needed for that choir lavishly for a noble performance. God has given us faith and all the graces necessary for godliness. We need to add to those by our diligent, that's our maximum effort and devotion uh, to personal righteousness. The word virtue there is a word um, that Peter uses. Uh, it's a word in the Greek that means the God-given ability to perform heroic deeds. I love that. Uh, it also came to mean the quality of life that made someone stand out as excellent. It never meant a cloistered excellence or an excellence of a of, of attitude, but it's excellence that's demonstrated practically in life. Peter here is writing of moral energy, the power that performs deeds of excellence. So he's talking about that quality, moral energy, virtue, that's the power to perform what we need to do to honor Christ. Now, also here, so giving, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge. Now, knowledge here means understanding. It means the correct insight. It means truth properly comprehended and applied. So the virtue that we have involves understanding. It means diligent study and pursuit of the truth that's in the Word of God. How do we know what to do if we don't have it studied God's Word? It shows us what we are to do. And then finally we have add the knowledge temperance. So temperance is self-control. Literally that's that inner strength. It's holding oneself in. Self-control is used of athletes as we talked about who are to be self-restrained self and self-disciplined. So a Christian is to control the flesh passions, the bodily desires, their own desires, rather than allow themselves to be controlled by them. So moral excellence, virtue, guided by knowledge and understanding of, the, of, of, of God's word, disciplines their desire and makes it the servant and so that we don't become the servant of desires. And then steadfastly, in this, the patience there is mentioned, and that is enduring and doing what is right, to keep doing it, never giving in to temptation or trial. Perseverance is the staying power that will die before it gives in. It's the virtue that will endure, not simply with, I give up, but with a vibrant hope, godliness. Let's look at uh, number seven. Love for Christ is the motivation for self-control and temperance. And that's, uh, that's the passage for the love of Christ constrains us. Verse 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And if that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The love of Christ constrains us. We love because he first loved us. Self-control, number eight, must be in accordance with the knowledge of the Word of God as we read from that passage in 1 Peter 1, 5 through 7. And sound doctrine, or it may result in error or excess, such as legalism. It's very easy if we think we're exercising self-control to go too far and get into do not do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. So, so be, doing self-control in accordance with God's Word keeps us from error. And then self-control number nine, self-control or temperance is not to be used in doing any evil or committing any sin. Now remember we talked about the secular definition of temperance is habitual moderation or, or um, indulging in moderation uh, in the indulgence, uh, including <laughs> moderation of indulgence in natural appetite. Well, moderation means I might do some, but, but not all. Well, in this case, self-control is don't do any, not, not don't compromise, don't do any. Self-control means complete separation from sin and complete separation unto God in response to sin as believers. And first, 2 Corinthians uh, 6.17 tells us 
Wherefore come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the an unclean thing, and I will receive thee. Be ye holy as I am holy, it also says. So we are to separate from sin to God. And that leads us to number 10. Despite being the last fruit of the Spirit, self-control and temperance are very important. And I hadn't really thought about this, but without self without self-control, sin would prevail and block all the other fruits of the Spirit from, from being operative. How can we love somebody if we're steeped in sin? How can we do a lot of the other, uh, how can we be patient when we're involved in sin? Because the Holy Spirit's not going to help us. Self-control requires walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit, which is essential for the other fruits of the Spirit. Now, Pastor Steve Cole has said, um, There's a paradox here. To be controlled in the Spirit results in being self-controlled. As we walk in the Spirit, He produces in us the ability to control every area of our lives and bring them in line with His holy purposes mm -hmm. and will. This implies active responsibility. That's a, that's a word for work, effort on your part. Sometimes uh, speakers on spiritual life just state that you are to be completely passive. Just let go and let God. If you're striving, you're not trusting. And I agree, this is clearly unbiblical. Paul wrote, for this purpose, I also I labor, striving. That word comes from a word that we get agonized from and it means what it sounds like agony it's hard it's an effort god gives us the power but we strive according to his power which mightily works within me and that's a colossians 129 paraphrase both are true the self-controlled person is submitting himself to god's will as revealed in his word whereas the self-willed person is acting for his own selfish desires disregarding what God wills because God has given us new life in Christ and gives given us his Holy Spirit to indwell us we have both the responsibility and the ability to yield our self-will our self-will to his revealed will and Pastor Cole goes on to say how we are to cultivate the grace of self-control says we are to walk by means of the Holy Spirit every day and I would add every hour this undergirds the whole process Galatians 5 6 paraphrase says but I say walk by the spirit and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh it goes on to talk about the strong desires of the flesh that war against the spirit if you do not conquer these desires you will not grow in godliness you don't win wars accidentally you know you know, Patton didn't say, I think I'll just kind of go up there and it'll all work out. No, he didn't let go. He controlled that. You must devote yourself to the battle. Especially we start talking about the out by talking about the battle for the mind. We must devote ourselves to battle. We must be committed to fight with everything we've got. Anything less will result, result in defeat. To walk by the Spirit means to depend upon and yield to the indwelling Holy Spirit, moment by moment, every day. Walking is not as spectacular as leaping or flying, but if you keep at it, he closes, you'll get where you're going, and that's godliness. So our summary here that we always close with, it's God's will that we be followers and imitators of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're aware of the character, attitudes, qualities, and virtues of Christ we're to bear the fruit of the Spirit as we serve and worship Him in obedience to God's Word. The Holy Spirit enables us to be temperate, self-controlled, and to grow by His grace. We're to be self-controlled as we walk in the Spirit in biblical love and unity. We're to be self-controlled servants of our faithful God, resting in His promises to meet all our needs as we obey, serve, and show our love for Him in the ministry that He's given us for the purpose of glorifying God. And my prayer is 
May we walk in the spirit, being self-controlled by the power, his power, for his glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the time we've had to look at your word. I pray that you would drive these truths deep into our heart, that we would rely upon the Holy Spirit and not ourselves, that we would make every effort moment by moment to serve you and have self-control and to be temperate, that we would use this fruit of the Spirit, that we would really be sensitive to the Spirit's leading. I thank you, Father, for each one that's here this morning. Pray that you would bless each family represented. We thank you for those that are watching. Again, I pray that you would be with those that are ill, provide healing, and we pray that you bless the service to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.